So, we stand before the human brain today. We've been pussyfooting around. We've been mentioning the brain, but we haven't gone into the brain in any detail. Uh, and there's good reasons for that. Um, when we turn our attention directly to the human brain, we are faced with some of the biggest questions we could possibly ever consider. The human brain is, at least from a human perspective, the biggest challenge and the most complex thing in the entire known universe. If we don't come to this with some sense of humility, we'll be lost altogether. We are going to concern ourselves in this lecture with how we study the brain, not how we study people. And when I say the brain, I mean the wet stuff. I mean the three and a half pounds of high cholesterol meat that's found inside skulls. Okay. As we approach this physical object in bodies, at the back of our minds should always be this question. We bring a set of assumptions to bear when we start doing science. We ask this question and not that question. We look for these kinds of indices or signs and not those. When it comes to the brain, we would be well advised to be extremely self-conscious about what we are expecting to find there and how much of this is pre-theoretical assumptions that we're making because we believe something. There has been no end of problems here. Francis Crick half of the Crick and Watson pair that were awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering the structure of DNA, turned his attention later on to neuroscience and specifically the cognitive neuroscience. And he's guilty of making what I think is one of the worst blunders in the history of science when he then said, he, he formulated what he called his astounding hypothesis. He said, you, your hopes, your dreams, your ambitions, your feelings, everything, you are nothing but a bunch of neurons. You are your brain. I think Crick was insane to say that. There is no warrant for this. That is a religious projection onto the brain of the kind that many others have made, but made more forcefully uh, and more strongly than others, and unfortunately made by someone who had the respectability of a Nobel Peace Prize in the field of biology. Most Nobel Peace Prize Winners do work that we don't actually, most of us don't understand. But we all feel that Crick and Watson showed us something that really changed us in the structure of DNA. So he has a huge degree of authority. And that doesn't stop him spouting such excoriating, terrible nonsense about the brain. So who should you believe, me or a Nobel Prize winner? Well, go with the Nobel Prize winner, obviously, right? My point is, I'm not going to tell you what, how to interpret brains. I'm going to tell you how we find out stuff about brains. But there's always, always, always this danger in the background that we're going to be projecting our desires, our beliefs about ourselves, onto this innocent lump of meat. When it comes to studying brains as brains, we have only a few avenues open to us. We do care greatly about human brains, and we have <coughs> obvious ethical concerns with studying them directly. So, unfortunately, one of the more lucrative sources of information in this domain has been pathology. What happens when things go wrong? When someone takes a bullet to the brain? When someone has trauma? When someone has a stroke? When someone develops a brain tumor? There's all kinds of evidence for what the brain was doing that can be garnered when the brain stops doing that. Imagine you come from Mars and you see all these motor cars around, and you're really interested in motor cars, but you only you restrict your observations to those which are broken, to the rust bucket where the engine has fallen out, to the car that's wrapped itself around the lamppost three times, to the car that God knows why just doesn't go you'd be kind of missing the object of study, wouldn't you? You'd be missing the functioning car, the car that does stuff. So it is with brains. We can learn a lot about pathology, from pathology, but there's an awful lot that we can't learn. 
There's another problem with studying brains which are diseased and broken, which is that each individual case here is unique. If someone takes a bullet to the head, the trajectory of that bullet, the nature of the damage done is entirely unique. We cannot do controlled studies. It doesn't generalize. Everyone else who took a bullet to the head took a different bullet with a different trajectory, causing different uncontrolled damage. So generalizing from these necessarily unique and often tragic cases is very, very difficult indeed. So pathology is important, but there's a lot of restrictions there. Animal experiments are going to be very important here. If we're, we have such well-grounded ethical concerns about dealing with human brains in living, functioning, healthy human beings, we have less concerns when it comes to animals. And the further we get away from humans, the less concern we have, but also the less we can learn. Because ultimately, we're interested in the human brain. That's the principal thing that we're interested in. And while it's very interesting to note for example, that there are commonalities across all nervous systems and brains, and even to project back, as we have done in this module, to the origin of the nervous system and suggest nervous systems evolved to support the business of getting around in the world. That doesn't tell us an awful lot about the human brain. As we get closer and closer to the human, the kind of things we're willing to do to those, the occupants of those brains, the, the owners of those brains, changes. And finally, some of the things that we'd most like to know about humans, those things that make us distinctively human and different from other animals, obviously cannot be found there at all. So when we ask about language, for example, or reason, we run into a brick wall there. There's some things we just can't ask. Now, we have seen in the last few decades an enormous increase in the number of imaging techniques that are available to us. And we'll be looking at some of those today and on Thursday. The technology here is changing very, very rapidly. And our ability to uncover both the structure and the activity of the brain has increased hugely. Very often, these techniques are based on rather complex physical principles that most people wielding them are not aware of. And that's a limitation that we will have to deal with. But imaging brings additional difficulties with it. Images don't interpret themselves. We need to interpret images. And while we are getting much, much, much better at making all different kinds of images of the brain, both structure and function, um, the interpretation of those images is as difficult as it ever was. The means of studying the brain that has the longest history is indirect, and that's through studying behavior on the assumption that there's a direct connection between behavior and brain or the nervous system. Um, we've encountered some of that in this module when we came to study the form of coordinated skilled action. And we discovered that the observation of the behavior allowed us to rule out one particular role for the brain that of master puppeteer telling all the parts what to do. That doesn't mean the brain is not involved, of course. It just means that by carefully studying the form of behavior, we were able to discipline our, our questions about what it is that the brain does. So although they're very indirect, behavioral studies have always played and will continue to play a huge role in uncovering these mysteries. We're going to start by going back to something which is non-scientific nonsense 200 and something years old, 216 years old, going back to 1800, started in the 19th century, and the Swiss anatomist Franz Josef Gall um, is credited, he wasn't the first one in this field, but he's credited with the um, articulation of the field of phrenology. Phrenology is not science, phrenology is nonsense. But that wasn't clear back in 1800. Around this time, theories of the physiology of the brain and its relationship to mental capacities, mental powers, and the origin of life itself are all coming to the fore. Many of you will have read the novel Frankenstein, which is a product of this period as well, um, which illustrates the thinking and wondering around the role of the brain and the electrical signals in the brain in that particular instance. The Franz Josef Gall believed that the brain was consistent, consisted of 27 distinct organs. 
That's 20, not one organ, but 27 distinct organs. And that these, for each organ, we could identify a specific function or capacity that it was responsible for. So we might find one organ which is responsible for the carnivorous instinct, and another organ which is responsible for the poetical talent. Because he believed that human nature was divisible into these separable areas of inquiry. This is, of course, specious nonsense. By 1850, this theory was thoroughly discredited. But it got really, really bad in the meantime. So as well as positing these uh, a priori understandings of human nature and projecting them onto the brain, there was the additional assumption that someone who is, for example, a very moral, upstanding character will have enlargement in that part of the brain which is responsible for moral character, while someone who's a criminal or a deviant or a homosexual or a Jew or uh, one of those things will have different kinds of shapes of organs in their brain. You can see where this is going. This is not a happy story. And then because brains themselves are difficult to study, they also posited that one might look at the shape of the skull and infer from that about the moral character of people and assign them to insane asylums or prison systems on the basis of bumps on the skull. This is really terrible science. <laughs> this is not science, right? Phrenology is not science. I mention it because we can laugh at it now, but we're in danger of committing exactly the same mistakes over and over and over. In fact, we do commit the same mistakes over and over again. And phrenology stands to us as a warning about the premature association of what we think the basic makeup of our human nature is with this innocent lump of meat that we're looking at. We've noted, for example, that with the advent of the computer <coughs> metaphor of the brain and the introduction of the information processing vocabulary to cognitive science, a whole bevy of work ensued. This was a new way of thinking about ourselves. And one of the main contributions from Jerry Fodor was a book called The Modularity of Mind, which suggested um, that the brain and the mind were identical, and furthermore, that it was divisible into a bunch of distinct modules. This is language coming from computer programming now. These modules were informationally encapsulated so that one module didn't know what the other module was doing. You had one module that was responsible for language, for example, one that was responsible for visual perception. And you can see where this is going. This is 27 distinct organs again with a faculty psychology. So we're always in danger of making the same mistakes. And we'll run into it again as we look at the fruits of modern neuroscientific imaging techniques, which produce these seductive pictures of brains with shiny colored blobs on them, where journalists are very, very quick to say, I say journalists and not neuroscientists, Journalists are very quick to say that the brain is lighting up and the area of the brain that does X is lighting at what? We don't know what any area of the brain does. This association of function with areas of the brain is completely primitive. We have to be very, very cautious here. That's the principal thing I want to convey to you. So, how do we, when we get away from phrenology, how do we study the brain? Well, here's a case... That's very famous. How many of you have heard of Phineas Gage? Vast numbers. Phineas Gage is one of those tragic cases in the medical history that makes it into popular culture and people know of Phineas. Phineas Gage was a foreman on a railroad construction in America in 1848 and they were blasting some rocks to clear the way for tracks and when you blast rocks what you do is you drill a hole and you put in some gunpowder and you tamp down the gunpowder carefully with a tamping iron and you put in a plug and some detonating cables and you retire to a safe distance and like Wile E. Coyote you push down that thing and it goes boom! Right. Now Phineas Gage was doing the tamping down the gunpowder bit when he inadvertently caused a spark which caused the gunpowder to explode prematurely and you can see what happened. The tamping iron shot out, flew in above his left eye here blew away most of the left front part of his brain, emerged from the top of his head and landed 10, 12 meters behind him. Ouch. This is a disaster. It was a disaster for Phineas Gage. He was knocked down. It's not clear whether he lost consciousness despite the size of the injury. He was whisked away. Doctors came to see him, and those doctors brought other doctors to see him. He was very, very well studied. 
so well studied that his skull is preserved. For example, this is a computer reconstruction of the path of the tamping iron. This is the actual goddamn tamping iron that did the damage. It's on display in Yale University. Um, as well as having a clearly defined and well studied injury, Phineas Gage seemed to be changed after this. He did try to go back to work, but he was fired after a while. And his friends and colleagues say that he was, his personality was altered as a result of this. They say that where beforehand he'd been very capable and efficient, capable of doing good planning, he was polite, constructive, and helpful. Afterwards, he was fitful, irreverent, and profane. He was engaged in temper tantrums, and he couldn't plan into the future. And his friends said he was no longer Gage. This story has acquired the status of a myth. There's a picture of Phineas Gage which surfaced recently, and according to the myth, and I stress it's a myth, he spent more or less the rest of his life as some kind of sideshow freak going around, as you see here, displaying the tamping iron that did so much damage to his head. And the truth is more complex than that, as usual. Um, there's a link there for your own information to a kind of up-to-date account that tries to distinguish fact from fiction here. It's now believed that Phineas Gage, uh, he did have a period where he was so changed, but he emigrated and went down to Chile, where he was working as a coach driver and getting by quite well, apparently. So we've got to separate myth from fact here. But the myth is important in its own right. It's gone down into the medical history, so much so that most of you are aware of this story. And this was one of the cases, one of the very first well-documented cases, in which a specific brain lesion, that's a damage to a specific part of the brain, could be linked to very specific observable symptoms. And the changes that were wrought in Phineas Gage were uh, themselves very, very interesting. It was this weird notion of personality. That's not something low-level that's easy to attribute to physiology. But it was this very high level thing of the spirit, personality, character, soul of the man itself that seemed to be changed. Something about the frontal lobe here is really, really important. This gave rise to the tradition that goes on today of trying to figure out which activities specific parts of the brain are important for. Now here we get into the danger of phrenology again, of the premature <coughs> association of function with location. We have to be very, very careful. It also gave rise to a tradition, somewhat regrettably, of medical intervention on the basis of over-enthusiastic attribution. And that gave rise in turn to a disgusting legacy of brain surgery called lobotomy, which started in the 1920s and was practiced up until the 1960s, in which patients victims who were behaviorally challenging, whose behavior couldn't be managed, were found after the application of a particular kind of surgery, known as psychosurgery, uh, to become docile and manageable. What they did was they went in with surgical instruments above the eye, just like with Phineas Gage, and basically reduced the frontal lobes to mush. It's horrible. And that was done for decades. The frontal lobes here have long been associated with these very, very nebulous attributes of the human person, personality, reasoning, and such like. They are very, very mysterious. And you recall, hopefully, that the frontal lobes are those parts of the human that mature, that have the longest maturational path, reaching their full maturity at the age of about 20 or 21. And furthermore, that if you were to characterize the human brain and distinguish it from other related brains of other mammals, it's our frequently enlarged frontal lobes is the first thing you'd look at. So there are mysteries are plenty in here. I hope you all remember these four basic lobes of the brain. Pretty much the whole front half of the brain, there is the frontal lobe. On top we've got the parietal lobe. At the back with the primary visual cortex is our occipital lobe. And on the sides we have the temporal lobe. Sitting underneath all that we've got the cerebellum, which is crucially involved in movement. And all this is cocooning around a really old, from an evolutionary point of view, part of the brain, the brain stem that's involved in making sure you keep breathing and your heart keeps beating and so on. So that frontal lobe is pretty much the front half of the brain. And here's a diagram that shows it a little bit better. We've met the primary motor area. That's just that one strip at the edge of it, at the back edge of it. The front of the brain here is to your left. 
The blue area, the premotor area here, is all known to be crucially involved in movement. But there again, as we saw, nervous system seems to have evolved from movement in the first place. That's not surprising. Actually, if you look at the brain, what you find is nearly every part of the brain is involved in movement, and nearly every part of the brain is involved in perception. That's becoming less of a surprise as well. So this business of projecting functions onto small parts of the brain, is, you've got to be cautious. But it's this prefrontal area here, that red bit, that's so freakishly enlarged in humans. It's quite pretty damn big in our nearest neighbors, the apes. Uh, but as you look further away from humans, it gets much, much smaller. And we have way more questions than answers in this instance. Now, me throwing up diagrams here is not a good way to lay, get to know the parts of the brain. I'm going to recommend a free software package to you. It's available for the free download for Windows and for Mac computers. There's a link to it. It's called Brain Tutor. I'll demonstrate it uh, at the end of the lecture. I don't want to break the slideshow because I'm recording it. Um, I'll demonstrate it to you at the end of the lecture. And it's a very nice way of learning just the big landmarks of the brain, where these various lobes are, and getting a feel for that. The images shown there are images that we'll be looking at now in a minute as we turn to magnetic resonance imaging. And what you see is uh, two, uh, sorry, three two-dimensional projections of the brain. When we image the brain, we're looking at a three-dimensional object. So what we do is we do cross-sections. And you can see three different kinds of cross-sections here, which again you can explore using that tool. And let's identify, just for the sake of orientation here, how we typically show pictures of the brain. Up there at the top left, you've got a horizontal or a transverse section. That's a horizontal cross-section through the brain. Here in the middle, we've got a coronal section, which will be like slicing down like this. And here in the, down at the bottom right, we've got a sagittal section, which is this kind of a planar section. Not necessarily through the middle of the nose, you can do them from left to right, but that's a sagittal section. Horizontal, also known as the transverse section, coronal section, and sagittal sections. Useful for getting your bearings, and here also are the basic anatomical markers that you need to know. The front of the brain here, this brain on the right, is the anterior, towards the back of the brain is towards the posterior, towards the top of the brain is superior, towards the bottom of the brain is inferior. There are some more anatomical terms, anatomy is full of them. We've met ventral and dorsal before. I'll just leave that there for your reference. So let's have a look at the frontal lobes of a few animals. Down at the bottom right, you can see the human brain. And in fact, this gyrus should also be colored blue because the frontal lobe goes back as far as here. That's kind of a mistake there. On the bottom left, you can see the chimpanzee, one of the animals that's closely, very, very closely related to humans. And they also have very large frontal lobes, but not as large as the human. But as we move away, we've got two different kinds of monkeys, a rhesus monkey and a squirrel monkey, and there are two other mammals who have complex lives, dogs and cats, you can see that the frontal lobes are vastly, vastly reduced. So whatever we learned about Phineas Gage is still deeply mysterious. These frontal lobes harbor all kinds of complexity that we, are, we, we understand very poorly. And this is where we need to be most cautious in jumping to say this part of the brain does X, Y, or Z, or the function of it is this, that, or the other. OK. Pathology, we just looked at Phineas Gage as an example of pathology, and it shows us what we can learn and what we can't learn. It's obviously problematic. Imaging looks really, really promising in this regard, and we're going to look first at magnetic resonance imaging. Magnetic resonance imaging is now a couple of decades old, and it's done in a scanner like this. How many people have been in a scanner? Probably half the class, usually. No? About a third of the class. Okay. Now, increasingly used as simple medical diagnostic tools. They don't only look at brains. You can image any part of the body. So I'm not asking for personal information here. Um, there's many, many, many reasons for being in a scanner. And those of you who've had the experience know you lie down on this stretcher-like thing, and you're then inserted into this narrow tube. This is not a pleasant experience for claustrophobics. As you're in there, you're surrounded, of course, by this big ring. Inside the ring are very large 
heavy magnets that are spinning very, very fast, and it's noisy. It's quite uncomfortable, and you're not allowed to move. The images, we just saw some of those cross-sectional images that result, are images of brain structure. They, despite the fact that they're black and white, they're not x-ray images. X-rays only illuminate calcified tissue, bones especially, but hard structures. MRI shows us soft tissue with a great deal of detail. The physics underlying these is really, really complicated. I'd love to explain it to you, but I don't understand it. Most people using these don't understand it. This is going to be true of pretty much all the technologies that we're using. And it's a call for caution because ideally the people who are doing this kind of really important interpretation of images should really understand how the images are made. Now, we live on Earth. Earth has a magnetic field. That magnetic field is measured in units called Teslas, actually micro-Teslas. It's a millionth of a Tesla, and the Earth's magnetic field is typically about 50 micro-Tesla. When we put people into these uh, scanners, a typical magnetic strength in the magnetic field is three Teslas. That's vastly stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. That's the reason you're not allowed to have your piercings, earrings, metal plates in there. It'll rip them right out of your body. They are that strong. It's not known how safe these very, very strong magnets are. Three Teslas we have a lot of experience with. Actually, UCD has no experience because they don't have an MRI scanner. And UCD Trinity has two. The one used for humans is three Tesla. They also have a seven Tesla scanner. It's a matter of some debate at the moment whether that's safe for use on humans. But you can use it for all kinds of other things. So if you've done animal studies and you've got a whole bunch of sacrificed rats and you want to image them, for example, that's, they're already dead, you can image them to your heart's content. You can image archaeological artifacts using a 7 Tesla scanner without worrying about it. Some people have been, some researchers have been putting people into 7 Tesla scanners, and I'm not sure that's a good idea, but we just don't know. It's, so we're still learning here. Generating an image with these things is slow and noisy. It's non-invasive. And uh, three Teslas, as far as we know, is completely safe. So that's great. And we get these very, very detailed images. Here's one of those transverse sections through the head. You can see the googly eyes at the front. You actually have googly eyes in your head. What do you know? And you can see the brain very, very clearly. And you can see the gap between the brain and the skull. You can see all kinds of structures. Those are the ventricles in the middle, those white sacs there. You can see very clearly the nice bilateral symmetry of the brain, the fact that the left half is almost a mirror image of the right half, almost, slight differences there. That's a transverse section, here's a sagittal section right down the middle. You can see the nose, you can see the tongue down at the bottom there. Uh, you can see some uh, big chambers in there, those are the resonant chambers that you use for making noise. It's a very, very detailed image, and just for completeness, here's a coronal section through like this through the brain. They're great. They are, they do take quite a long time to capture, although we're getting much better these days now the state of the art will allow real-time MRI imaging of speech movements, for example. So a colleague of mine in London, Sophie Scott, has done some lovely work looking at real-time imaging of beatboxers, for example, which is very, very cool. So that's where we are at the state of the art. These are not the images that have the imaginations so inflamed. Those are the fMRI images, functional magnetic resonance images. And I want you to get a sense for the difference between an MRI image that we've just seen and a functional magnetic resonance image in an fMRI. fMRI is done in an MRI scanner. That's true. So the basic principles are the same. But it's capturing a different signal. It has to capture a signal really, really quickly because we're here we're interested in trying to get a brain physiology and not brain anatomy. The MRI image we saw is just reveals brain structure, but shows us nothing about how the brain works. Now, the signal that's picked up in an fMRI experiment is very restricted. The brain is perfused with blood. It uses a lot of blood. There is a vague assumption, a loose assumption, that if some part of your brain is working harder, its blood needs are greater. It needs more oxygen. Blood delivers oxygen through hemoglobin, where it's used, and so the blood flowing to the brain has a different oxygen characteristic than blood flowing from the brain. It's this blood flow, 
the signal from the hemoglobin, which is, of course, based on the iron molecule, that's the signal that's been picked up in the <coughs> fMRI scan. The signal is called a blood oxygen level dependent signal, or bold signal. So it's not measuring brain activity. Let's be very clear about that. It's measuring regional blood flow. In order to make sense of this, we overlay those readings of regional blood flow on structural images obtained using an MRI. So when you see an fMRI image, usually you're looking at a composite in which we have a structural image which is obtained first, and then we have a registration of blood flow which is overlaid on top of it. In fMRI, we get pretty good spatial resolution. That means we can see changes in blood flow at the level of about a cubic millimeter. We get rotten temporal resolution. If something happens, if, for example, you're in a scanner and suddenly the experimenter shines a big light at you and plays a big noise, it takes about five seconds for that to influence regional blood flow. So we're looking at something about five seconds after the fact. And so our ability to make any kinds of fine temporal discrimination here is basically nil. So in an fMRI, we start with an MRI scan. Here's a basic transverse cross-section through a brain obtained using an MRI scan. And then we, ha we have the subjects take part in various experimental conditions. And we register the blood flow. And we overlay those here. So here's a bunch of overlaid colored blobs on a single MRI scan. That's the kind of image that you see reported in the press. That's where they come from. These are the blood oxygen level dependent signals. And specifically, what's registered is the contrast between two experimental conditions. Where is there more blood flow in one condition compared to another condition? If I were to tell you that this subject was looking at something, you'd go, ah, yeah, that makes sense because we've got an increase in blood flow here in the occipital lobe and primary visual cortex. So you can see, you're not mind reading, you can see from this that in one of these conditions the subject was looking at something compared to the other condition. There's a lot more images, and these are a sequence, a temporal sequence of images, but the ability to resolve in time is very, very poor. These are two-dimensional cross-sections we can, using the fabulous machinery of computers, generate lovely three-dimensional images here. But let's be clear, brains are not lighting up. Nothing is lighting up in the brain. The red and yellow that you see are ink. Right? They could just as well be blue or green. Brains don't light up. We record increases in regional blood flow that is different in contrasting experimental conditions. So here's a kind of a typical procedure that we do. We first do a high-res anatomical MRI scan. We're going to need a good image of this subject's brain. Brains differ hugely from one individual to another. Next time you're at home and you have a couple of brains lying around, take out your two human brains, slap them down on the kitchen counter, and have a good look at them. You'll find them comparable in a gross sense. They'll both have well-defined hemispheres. You'll be able to identify those four lobes on each. You'll find the cerebellum on each. You'll find the corpus callosum linking the two hemispheres on each. But now attend to the detail and look at these individual sausage-shaped folds on them. Some of them will be comparable across the brains, like the primary motor cortex. You'll hopefully see that on both brains. But some folds will be different on one brain than they are on the other. and That's at a very coarse level. As you now pay attention to finer and finer details, your ability to map from one brain to the other will go away completely. And by the time you get down to bunches of neurons, there'll be no correspondence whatsoever. So each brain is an individual. Brains are very different, and so when we're looking at an individual in the scanner, we need to know how is their brain shaped? What's the shape of their brain? <laughs> Having done that, let's imagine an experiment in which we're contrasting you looking at a blank screen, dark blank screen, with you looking at a picture of a cute kitten. Okay, that's kind, and we call that picture of a kitten a stimulus. God help us. What we would do, typically, after getting the MRI scan, is we would do about 150 low-resolution scans. We need a lot of repetition to get a clear signal. Each of them takes about five seconds, and half of those will be you staring at a blank screen, and half of those will be you staring at a picture of a little kitten. And then we compare the regional blood flow across these conditions 
And those blobs come from saying that well, in one condition there's more regional blood flow than in the other condition. I say, I use a technical term there, voxels. You all know pictures are made up of pixels. Digital pictures are made up of pixels, little squ colored squares. But when you move to three-dimensional images, they're made up of voxels. That's a volumetric cube, a tiny little cube. And here's one we get. Here we've got an average MRI image. You can see what happens when we average across subjects. We get this very great blur because your brain is different from my brain. Brains are very, very different. And there's overlaid on it. There are those colored areas are the areas in which there was more blood flow in one condition, staring at a kitten, than in the other condition. Can I just ask you to consider what would happen if you're lying there and I'm going to show you a picture of a kitten? The first time I show you a picture of a kitten, you're going to go, hmm, kitten, that's kind of cute. Second time I show you the picture of a kitten, you're going to go, I recognize that kitten, I just saw it. The third time you're going to go, uh-huh. The 60th time you're going to go, Jesus, this is getting really, really old. Right? I might have to do that 50, 60, 70, 80 times in this experiment. And each one of those presentations is different. Remember the first one you went, that's a kitten. The second one you went, I recognize that kitten. The 60th you went, get me out of here. So when we average all those, we're pretending that the same thing is happening all the time. And it's not. Each one of those presentations is different. All we can capture is whatever they had in common all the time. So we can't capture everything about you seeing a kitten here at all. So this is the first of the issues we face with these images, which are fascinating images. But we have to average over multiple presentations, which means that we can't see what was unique to anyone. We can only get something which is shared across them all. We've got this problem of comparing details from one subject with details from another subject because brains do exhibit a great deal of variation from one person to the other. We're looking at an increase in blood flow in one condition compared to another condition. This represents a style of thinking which has dominated neuroscience for several decades and is currently being called greatly into question because decrease, when you're dealing with a system which is active all the time, a decrease might be just as important as an increase. And then I want to bring us back to phrenology, bring us back to Franz Josef Gall and this idea that the brain is some kind of raw canvas that we can project our own pre-theoretical beliefs about the structure of human nature onto. So when we say that because we saw an increase in blood flow in one area when looking at a picture of a kitten compared to another area, that doesn't mean that we've identified the part of the brain that looks at kittens. Brains don't look at kittens. People look at kittens. Okay, let's be very, very clear. This is a, the fMRI. It almost invites us to make these mistakes, the phrenological mistakes. So phrenology is really important as a historical warning sign to us. It is the darling of the press. People love them some fMRI images with these coloredy blobs. They are hard to interpret, and it's a very crude tool. One of the greatest problems we face is that we are measuring blood flow. We are not registering nervous system activity. We are not registering the activity of the brain. We're registering the supply of blood about five seconds after something happens. And the relationship between blood flow and nervous system activity is itself poorly understood and is a cause of great existential concern in the neuroscientific community at the moment. So we're not sure what this signal is about, and even if we were well appraised of the relationship between blood flow and nervous system activity, we don't actually know which aspects of nervous system activity we should be paying attention to. So I just want to make it perfectly clear to you that despite these huge and really important and interesting developments, we have far more questions than answers, and we are at the beginning of a journey and not the end. I pointed out the time problem there before. Okay, fMRI is undoubtedly the imaging technique that has captured the public imagination most. There are several other ones based on arcane physical principles, like positron emission tomatography, for example, and something like squid sensors, or MEGs, which we won't get into. They, all, they differ in their shortcomings. Each one has different strengths and different weaknesses. We'll just look in some detail there at fMRI because it's so popular. Another kind of imaging 
which has uh, made great strides recently, is anatomical rather than physiological in nature, and it's mapping out the connections between brain areas. Mapping brain connectivity is really important. As you know, nerve cells are very small, but they have long projections called the axons. An actual, a sing the projections of a single cell could be this long, or even this long, or an extremis, even this long. So we've got these long, very, very fine connections throughout the brain but they're very, very hard to follow. You can't follow them in a microscope. They're much too fine to follow like that. So we've been developing new techniques. Diffusion tensor imaging is slightly older than the more modern diffusion spectrum imaging. And these are delivering us pictures of brain connectivity such that we're finding out some very basic anatomical facts about the brain now that we didn't know before. Perhaps the most important thing we found using these is the masses of reciprocal interconnectivity. By reci reciprocal connectivity, I mean if one area of the brain projects to another area of the brain, usually there's a direct projection back, or at least via one or two stops we can project back, so that everything is connected to everything else, so that we can't think of the brain as some kind of serial processor with stages from inputs to outputs. The brain is an endogenously active, that is active in its own right, a uh, system in which all these parts are shining and twinkling. They're not shining literally, they're not twinkling literally, but it's doing stuff all the time. The kind of images we get out of these are really striking. This is from a, a, a marmoset brain, not a human brain. The word brainbow has been coined to uh, just to index the kind of color the ink that's used. Remember, the brain itself is kind of gray and ugly. Um, but those illustrate some of the richness of the connections that we're uncovering. And if that's a marmoset brain you've done using defense diffusion tensor imaging, here's a, some images of the human brain done using the more recent diffusion spectrum imaging. These are from, from 2012. And as recently as that, we were discovering this entire sheet of connections, which underlies the cortex, connecting long-range areas of the brain that are hugely distant from one another, there you can see a view of it. It's like a kind of a fabric with a warp and a weft with these long-range connections going from front to back and from side to side. This was unknown before 2012. So we're still finding basic anatomical insights using these imaging techniques. Imaging techniques have come very, very far, and we've a lot left to learn. We'll look at some more of them in the next lecture. We're going to wrap up with a little bit of a caution cautious note about this prefix neuro. As neuroscience makes great strides, and it undoubtedly does, we get a host of people who are all too willing to overinterpret what should be cautious scientific results. And so we get the birth of these neuro disciplines like neuroaesthetics, neuroethics, neuromusicology, and neuroart history. I think I made up neuroart history myself, but this field has got so crazy I can't even remember. There probably is neuroart art history out there. Neurobabble is a real, real problem in its own right. Uh, it prevents us doing good science by over-enthusiastically projecting all these beliefs, hopes, and desires of what humans will turn out to be onto this complex thing called a brain. The most important lesson from this section of the module, and the most important lesson from the module as a whole, is this. Don't confuse people with brains. Sorry, Francis Crick. You are not your brain. You have a brain. You have a lot more. Okay. Um, when we come to interpret brains, when we look at imaging experimental results in the field of neuroscience, I want everyone to be cautious. I want all neuroscientists to be cautious. I want cognitive scientists to be cautious. And I want to instill a sense of caution in you. That's not to insist that things are one way or the other. It's to withhold that, to hold off because we have a long, long history of over-interpretation, enthusiastically over-interpreting brains. I'm going to stop right there.